and happy Remake Learning Days. This is Kat from the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, and today I'm going to tell you about some of the native reptiles that you can find in our Eastern Kentucky region, maybe even in your own backyard. I have a few different kinds of reptiles to highlight, and I'll also go over a few ways that you can either welcome or avoid the reptiles in your backyard. So, I will begin by going to get the very first animal. Hey, okay. This first animal that I am showing you now is one that is not very common throughout Kentucky, though they do exist in a couple of regions. One of their populations is in eastern Kentucky, very close to where our zoo is. And this is a corn snake. Corn snakes are a non-venomous snake. They are found in forests and fields. Their populations increase the closer you get to the south. So you can find more corn snakes as you head more towards Florida. But this one is a Kentucky corn. They're called corn snake because of the pattern on their belly. You may notice that their back has this lovely reddish, orangish color to it with these darker blotches, but their underside has this lovely checkerboard pattern. Now, this checkerboard pattern is what gives them their name. If you think about wild corn, maybe you've seen it on display in a Thanksgiving display, then you'll notice that the kernels are many different colors of varying dark blacks and reds to yellows, oranges, and whites, and the different dark and light blotches on his belly resemble that. Hence the name corn snake. There's also the theory that the corn snake was found in corn fields, which would make sense. This is actually a close relative of the rat snake. Now rat snakes are very common in Kentucky. We have what's called the midland rat snake, who looks very much like this in body, but has a dark brown to almost black back pattern and a white kind of solid underbelly. They both grow to be about four feet, though midland rat snakes can push six feet. And they are found in fields for very good reason. As the name rat snake suggests, they eat lots of rats. They could be found in fields because that is a good source of food for them. If they live or are found near a crop field, well then the crop field is attracting something very important to these snakes and that's rodents. So they'll come into these fields to eat the crops because they like a lot of the foods we do, rodents do. And then their presence will attract their predators, which can include birds of prey or things like cats, especially stray cats and snakes, of course. But snakes are very important to the ecosystem. They have a special ability, a gift you might say, for finding rodents, and that's this body shape. When you think about rodents running away from us, they tend to run and hide in a tiny space. Their shelter is a nest that they create by tunneling into a nice, tight, small space where they fit and their predators don't. However, Snakes have a special advantage in their body shape. They are narrow. They can grow in length, but they don't grow as much in width. And this provides them the ability to get into rodent burrows. So they can infiltrate the places that the rodents live and eat more of them as a result. And this can protect not just crops, but homes as well, because we've all probably dealt with a rodent or two in our house from time to time and they do some things that we don't find particularly convenient, such as eating our pantry food, or they might uh, chew on your stuff to make their nests, like clothing or electrical cords, which is dangerous, or other items. And of course, they could do structural damage because when they dig the holes to build their nests, in nature, it would be in things like fallen logs. But in your home, it could be in things like drywall or things that are kind of important to hold up our buildings. So having snakes out in the ecosystem gives us a preventative measure, a first step to controlling the number of rodents out there. 
rodents have to be controlled because they are very good at having large families and having litters very often. So having predators out there to make that balance and keep that population number stable is quite necessary. And snakes, as a result, are quite necessary to have out and about. I will move on to the next reptile now. So I'll let you get one more good look at our corn snake. <laughs> okay. For our next Kentucky reptile, we have this little guy. This is an eastern box turtle. Eastern box turtles are found throughout the eastern United States. They get the name box turtle because of an ability that they have, similar to what other turtles and tortoises do, but they can take it one step further. So any turtle that might be faced with a predator out in nature has this ability in their neck. Their necks are long and can flex and hinge themselves inward. So of course a turtle or a tortoise can pop their head into their shell. They can also draw their feet up into their shell as well. But a box turtle can actually fit their head and legs in this inner space here. And on their plastron, the bottom of their shell, they have a muscular hinge. This hinge can flex a bit. So these two pieces, the upper and the lower, can actually pinch together, which essentially shuts their shell. Hence the name box. A box turtle can actually enclose their shell and shut it like a box. Otherwise, box turtles are found very often through forest floors. You can see their beautiful camouflage, which is very great, especially if you think about the sun shining through the trees in a forest and casting light upon the ground. Those sunlight blotches are very reminiscent of the pattern on their shell, which helps them to blend in even better with the forest floor. Fox turtles do a number of things in the forest floor that are very helpful to the overall ecosystem. They eat mostly vegetation, so they can walk around eating some low growing plants and things, but occasionally they're scavengers. This means that if there is decaying or dead animal matter on the forest floor, the box turtle will occasionally eat that too. And doing that can help with a kind of a forest cleanup. It gets rid of this material a little bit faster. So they're like a little cleanup crew. I mentioned that they live in a forest floor, which is not a body of water. Forest is a land, of course. And yes, we say box turtle, not box tortoise, but this is a type of turtle that lives on land. Because it is not a very black and white naming system between turtle and tortoise as to which one does what, you can just look at their adaptations to figure it out. If you look at the way a land turtle or tortoise is built, especially in their legs, you'll see that he has some long sturdy legs there, a bit narrower perhaps, and they don't flatten out at the ends. A water turtle, of course, as a swimmer, will have big wide flat webbed feet adapted for swimming and paddling. This turtle is lacking that feature. Instead, their legs have to be sturdy and strong to pick up and carry their body wherever they go. This shell is not a house for them, but their back and a part of their skeleton. Their spine is located just underneath the top of their shell. So it is a literal part of them. It's made of bones, it is their body, but because bones are a bit more dense, it's a little bit extra weight in their body to carry. So their legs have to be adapted, not just to walk all day, but to walk with a heavier body proportionate to their size. So turtles and tortoises that live on land have these nice sturdy legs to lift and carry them as they go so that they can find everything they need before they run out of energy. Another interesting thing about the box turtle is their home range. 
reptiles in general don't travel too awfully far in their lives, but box turtles especially have a home range of about one square mile. It's very small. Because of this, trying to rescue a box turtle or move a box turtle can actually cause them some issue. Box turtles, much like birds and, and many other animals, have a honing ability, which is the ability to find their way back to their home range or to a specific location. Think about sea turtles returning to the same beaches year after year. That is a honing skill, the ability to innately understand how to get back to where you belong or want to be. So a box turtle, moved to a new location has the ability to hone and find their way back to their home range. If they're moved very far though, well, that is a very long journey to make. And it can also put them in, in a lot of danger because if they're placed on a path that might take them across a road or through a place with many predators or other hazards to them, that could be dangerous for them despite the fact that all their instincts are telling them to return to their range. So if you ever see a box turtle in need of help, it's good to call a wildlife rehabber or wildlife control person, and they know how to provide the right care and make an assessment as to whether or not this box turtle can be returned and when and how. For this box turtle that we have at the zoo, they're a good ambassador species. They're a species that will stay here at the zoo, but provide an excellent service to humanity by being an individual that people can look at and learn about. This was a rescued animal removed from its area because it was found too close to a road. If you see a box turtle trying to catch or trying to cross a road, the best thing to do for them is to keep moving them along their way. For example, if you see the box turtle at this side of the road pointing this way and they have not entered the street yet, turning them around will not change their mind. As I said, they have a keen sense of direction and where they want to go and where they need to go. And roads aren't really part of nature to them, so they don't pay them any mind. It's just a piece of land to get across. So if they are pointed in this way, the best service to them is to get them across the dangerous obstacle of the road and get them further in the direction that they're pointed. You can't change their mind, but you can scoot them a little bit faster and farther across. That is, if it is safe to enter the road. If it is not, then it is not worth anyone getting hurt entering a roadway. But yeah, box turtles might cross roads to get to new ponds, to new water sources, new food sources, or returning for a place to lay eggs. And so we might see them occasionally on the road. The safest thing to do if you do drive a vehicle is to just keep an eye out. Be mindful of the road. If you're going the correct speed and you're keeping uh, your eyes on the road, then though they may be small, they're also possible to notice and avoid. All right, on to the next one. So this thing is another Kentucky non-venomous native known as the black king snake. Black king snakes are found all throughout Kentucky, especially in its forests. They're identified by having a mostly solid black back with some light cream colored speckling there. And then the speckling increases once you get to their belly. This one also has some light stripes towards the front of her head, which is very lovely. But king snakes, though they are non-venomous, they're known for having a special ability in what they eat. And this is why we call them kings. King snakes may also eat rodents like our corn snake or other rat snakes and non-venomous or all snakes out there. But king snakes are called king because of their tendency to eat all of their snakes. There's a saying, especially out here in Eastern Kentucky, where people will say, don't kill black snakes. This is the black king snake, easily confused with a black rat snake or black racer perhaps. But when people are referring to black snakes, they're talking about the king snake. 
because of its ability to eat other snakes, they are seen as a type of snake to kind of give space to and respect to, or let them do what they're going to do because they're going to eat the other snakes. So for people who don't want snakes around their property, if they do see a black snake, they might give it a pass because having the black snake around would actually be a deterrent to having other snakes in that area because this is a predator to them. Now this also includes the native venomous snakes of this area, which would be the northern, or excuse me, eastern copperhead now, the eastern copperhead and the timber rattlesnake. The king snake is able to eat them both. They have adapted an immunity to the venom of these snakes because they have um, both lived alongside each other for eons. And so they are able to eat those without having to suffer the effects of their venom. So they don't have to worry about identifying this animal or the animal that they want to eat or discerning whether or not it'd be harmful to them. They can just proceed. But because they're a non-venomous snake, they're a constrictor. They don't have venom of their own. So they would eat just like other non-venomous snakes do, like we think of boas and pythons and wrapping around their prey. King snakes would do the same thing, even to another snake. They even eat other king snakes. So um, courtship is a bit of a tricky process for them. Has to be right time, right place, right mate. <laughs> but this one is actually the daughter of one of our king snakes on display here at the zoo. So of course, they are able to successfully reproduce and continue their species. Now, a lot of people have ways to tell venomous snakes apart from non-venomous snakes, and we'll talk a bit more about that soon. But all snakes in the wild really just want to have space. So even if you become familiar with the snakes of your area, it is good to know the way that snakes might think about us. Think about the way that our bodies are built and the way that snakes move and sit. They sit flat upon the ground with their head down, they don't stand upright on their tails or balance like a spring. So they're very low. They may be long. And this snake can get about four to six feet in length, but they're not tall. Whereas us humans, we are very tall. Our eyes stand very far above the ground. And from a snake's perspective, that makes us a bigger animal. Even if this girl were six feet long, though I may be five feet tall, I'm still bigger than her and her eyes. In the wild, it's a pretty logical way of thinking. The bigger animal is the one that can eat the smaller animal. So a predator is a larger animal and prey tends to be the smaller of the two. So snakes will try to protect themselves from what they perceive as a potential predator. It's all logic. A snake in the wild might not have never seen a human and doesn't know whether or not we might be a friend or a predator. So they will act on the cautious side, the side that gives them the better chance of survival. And snakes have many defenses. King snakes, rat snakes, um, corn snakes, they all have this ability to waggle their tails. And that might make you think of another type of snake, the rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes have just adapted with this extra bit of keratin at the end of their tail and these loose keratin pieces that can knock together to make a loud sound. When other types of snakes, and there are many others that will wag their tail like that and vibrate it, they at the very least can do that in leaf litter and loose debris on the ground. And that can still make a bit of noise. So they still have this ability to alert predators to their presence. If they feel like they're being threatened, they can warn them to stand back and not proceed. There are many other types of adaptations too and defenses which are fun, including musking, which is releasing smelly smells, hissing very loudly and making lots of noise, puffing up or raising your head to look as big as you can. And then of course, perhaps throwing in a couple strikes as a way to say, this is my bubble and I don't want you in it. If we were to ignore all of that language from snakes, and pick up a wild snake. If you think about what we were talking about with an animal potentially being a predator, then of course, 
picking them up really might convince them that they're about to be eaten. How would you act in that situation? Most people I ask say that they would run or fight. And that is exactly the same logic that a snake would follow. If they can flee, they'll flee. If they feel like they can't, then they'll try to save themselves however possible. And as a last resort, if they feel like they must, they can bite. They don't have sharp nails, fists to punch, feet to kick, but they do have sharp little teeth. Those teeth are for eating, but if they need to, they might be able to pinch or hurt someone just enough to get them to go away and not try to hurt them. So giving snakes space in the wild is the one surefire way to avoid being bitten and also avoid making this animal uncomfortable. So if you hate snakes, then you probably don't want to be near them and giving them more space is just more of the good thing. If you love snakes, just know that that behavior of giving them space is the way to respect them and respect how they might feel or view you. It's giving them love and care. And if they do that, then just like we talked about with the corn snake, that snake, if it lives on, will continue to eat rodents, which plays their part in the whole habitat. And it, it keeps the environment good and moving and picking along in a healthy way. All right, on to the next one. So this guy is a common snapping turtle. We very lovingly call this one marshmallow. And marshmallow is a smaller adult. Common snappers live all throughout Kentucky. We do have the alligator snapping turtle at the very, very western end of the state near the Mississippi River. But for our territory in eastern Kentucky, this is the species of snapper that occurs here. Common snappers can grow to be about a foot, maybe closer to two feet in shell length if it's a really big one. As opposed to alligator snapping turtles, common snappers have this smoother shell as they grow. It might start off a little bit spikier looking, but it doesn't maintain its giant spikes the way that an alligator snapper shell will through its entire life. The common snappers, like we discussed with the box turtle, have these nice webbed feet. So you can see that their feet are well adapted, all four, for swimming. And they spend their lives in the water mostly. In the water, they're going to be looking for things like fish or small crustaceans or other arthropods and things like crawdads. If something falls into the water, like a, for a little one, like a bug, for a bigger adult, something like a small mammal or a bird, if it falls to the water, it's fair game to the snapping turtle. And another thing that sets these guys apart from the alligator snapper is the way in which they catch their food. Now, alligator snapping turtles classically are known for fishing. They have a lure on their tongue shaped like a worm. And they use that lure to draw fish into their mouth. <laughs> well, you can see with this guy, He's a busier sort. Common snappers are active hunters swimming down after their prey. And you can see he's demonstrating to you that he has a very long neck. So this is the adaptation he has. His mouth has no lure. In fact, it's very pink on the inside if you catch a glimpse of it. But he can chase after his prey and extend his long neck out to reach and grab something that he is so close to eating. That being said, just like snakes and other wild animals, they see humans as a very large, tall animal. And if the human is messing with them, well, that could be a predator situation. So snappers in the wild also prefer their space and prefer the path of uh, best survival, you could say. So it's a good thing to note how long their necks can extend out. And you notice I'm keeping my hands way back here on him. And that's because snapping turtles don't prefer to be picked up and moved around like this. 
even Marshmallow here, who's lived at the zoo for some time, has his preferences, and this isn't one of them. <laughs> There's a good view of his mouth. <laughs> so we'll get through this quick, my friend. But yes, they have a nice long neck, which means if I were to touch him in the middle of his back, behind his head, his front feet, uh, anywhere closer to the front end of his body, he has the potential to reach his head around to me. And I fully understand if he would rather communicate to me that he wants to be put down in any way possible. If he were to snap at me, that's my fault. I'm the one lifting him up and going on about it. And he's just telling me what he prefers. So a snapper in the wild will probably feel very similar. <laughs> and if you try to pick them up on the sides like I was holding the box turtle, well, they might surprise you with how far they can reach. So giving them space is another good strategy. However, similar to the box turtle, they will come up on land to traverse from pond to pond, lake to lake, water to water. If the place where they are staying, the water body of water that they are staying in is uh, drying up perhaps uh, in times of drought or food is scarce in that area or it's not ideal for laying eggs and it is a female turtle needing to do so, they'll move. They will walk across the land to find a new body of water to settle in that has more of what they need. So you might see snapping turtles crossing the road, especially as we get into summertime. If you see one crossing the road and you really want to help them, Please bear in mind how they might feel about it and how far they can reach. Be able to. But just like the box turtle, they're going to go in the direction they're facing. So you can't turn them around or change their mind. And if you think it could be any danger to you or the turtle, or you don't want to go in a roadway, by all means. It is not the easiest thing to do. And the snapper, unfortunately, probably won't understand the help that you're trying to give it. So <laughs> it takes people who are familiar with the turtles and what they're capable of sometimes to help them in situations like those. <laughs> but then they'll continue on and find a nice spot to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in mud. They dig in and the little hatch out. Later. Well, things about you. A couple myths about snapping turtles. One is that if you are snapped, they won't let go until the sun goes down or it thunders. That's not true. They'll let go when they think they should. Unfortunately, that could take more or less time than it takes to thunder. Depends on the weather and the turtle. Giving them the freedom to walk away. Like if he were to snap me right now, I'd probably lower us both to the ground so that he can let go and have the freedom to walk away, not be hanging by a human <laughs> and, uh, and make the decision himself to escape. So you just get them to the ground, leave them alone, and they'll let go when they think the situation's safe to do so, unfortunately. <laughs> I can't guarantee it'll be comfortable, but that's what makes them feel the to hands off and let them be back in their element. Okay, speaking of, I will put you back in yours. One more good look at him. And there we go. Show you today. So I think I would be remiss if I were to ignore the fact that we do have venomous animals here in Kentucky. So this is the Eastern Copperhead. I'll try to rotate him a bit so that you can see top and bottom of him. The eastern copperheads are found throughout the state of Kentucky. If you were to look at a range map of them, you would see a couple gaps in their range, usually around major metropolitan areas like Lexington, Louisville, interstate corridors, things like that. This animal spends much time in fields and forests. It's a good place to live. Now, copperheads are indeed venomous. And there are a couple ways people try to say that they can tell that a snake is venomous or not. 
they eyes. Now, if I can hold him up properly to the camera and it focuses right, you might notice that he has tiny little slit pupils. Some people say that that is the mark of a venomous snake. However, his eyes are an adaptation, but for something else. Right now, his pupils are very tiny, but we're out on a bright day. And pit vipers and vipers are actually venomous, or excuse me, nocturnal venomous snakes. Being nocturnal means that you need to be able to listen well in the dark. And the best adaptation for that is having pupils that can control how much light gets in very well. So, cats. All of the nocturnal animals and therefore have very tiny slit pupils. Cats and alligators aren't venomous. So it's not an indicator of whether or not they have venom. It is a coincidence that venomous snakes in Kentucky are pit vipers and therefore they are the ones with slip pupils and our non-venomous snakes are diurnal or active in the daytime and therefore they have round pupils. If you travel the world though, you'll meet diurnal venomous snakes like mambas or cobras and you'll meet nocturnal venomous snakes like pythons and boas. So it's not a strict rule. I also must note that in low lighting, no matter how your pupils are shaped, they will open very big and round and wide to let in the light. So a copperhead in nature will probably be hiding in a low lit place, leaf litter under a log, something like that. And to see their eye very clearly, you'd have to stay pretty still or get pretty close. And I, <laughs> most scenarios in which people meet with snakes in nature don't really go that way. Another method that people may be told is the shape of their head. Again, you might notice that the copper head, though he's twisted around himself very nicely, I'm trying to rotate so you can see, his head is triangular, diamond-shaped, arrow-shaped, however you may be told this. And again, pit vipers and vipers do have that shape in their head. This is true. The fact that their head is wider to accommodate for the muscles surrounding their venom glands but it's not the only way to be venomous. Cobras, again, mambas, things like that, coral snakes in the Southern United States, their heads are not distinct from their neck. So it's not a requirement of a venomous snake to have a head shaped this way. Also, a lot of tactics, as I said, in snake defenses include looking bigger. And there are many non-venomous snakes that may try to widen their head and body to look bigger. But in doing so, they're taking their jaws and stretching them out, which creates a diamond shape. So many non-venomous snakes might end up doing something that makes them appear venomous. One particular candidate is the northern water snake, a non-venomous snake found very commonly throughout eastern Kentucky. And they flatten their heads when they feel threatened. And they get very easily confused with a venomous snake. And when people think of a venomous snake in the water, they tend to think of a cotton mouth. Unfortunately, these water snakes get confused with cotton mouths. And the extremely sad part is that cotton mouths are not found in this particular part of Kentucky. So they might meet to a, a bad end when there was never a venomous snake like it in the area. There are copperheads though. So I don't think I need to tell anyone that they definitely deserve respect in space because in their defense, they might also utilize this fantastic adaptation that they have, venom. And a venomous snake like this doesn't cause human deaths. It is not a life or death, you'll drop if you're bitten sort of deal. But if you see a snake and you happen to be bit by it and you think it may be venomous, the best thing to do is just go straight to the hospital. Do it as fast as you can in a safe way. You don't have to fling cars off the highway, rushing to get there, though I can't guarantee you won't, won't feel like you need to because it's, uh, it is notably painful. The venom does cause pain, but the only way to stop venom in a body is through the use of anti-venom. Anti-venom is antibodies against venom. 
people will take venom and introduce it to livestock like sheep or horses slowly over time so that those animals create antibodies and then that is collected oh are you yawning that is collected <laughs> to create anti-venom apparently i'm boring so all you need is to get to a major hospital they will have the anti-venom there is only one anti-venom in the united states for all of our venomous snakes except for the coral snake which in kentucky those are not found here so any venomous snake bite in this state would be treated with the same anti-venom. So there's no need to wait, no need to catch the snake, no need to bring the snake to the ER. <laughs> All you need to do is get to that hospital. A lot of the first aid misconceptions that go around include wrapping a tourniquet and pinching off the bitten limb or cutting the bite wound to try and let the venom flow back out or sucking the venom out and I can tell you that none of these will work. Pardon me, I'm going to reset him a bit because he's getting a little bit curious about the hook and climbing. There we go, my friend. So if you are to tie off or tourniquet your bitten limb, you're trapping a lot of venom in a small space like your hand. Better to just let it dissipate through your body because venom includes some things that can cause tissue damage and you don't want to put a whole lot of tissue damaging venom in a small space like your hand or foot and of course cutting or sucking on the venom or the wound doesn't remove all the venom you cannot guarantee that you would remove any at all there may still very well be venom venom in the body and you're kind of just causing more harm and injury to the bite site which is also not a good thing so again all you need in a venomous snake bite kit is a set of barkies and the directions to the nearest hospital Now, if you were to go out into nature, like our zoo is located right next to the beautiful Red River Gorge, which is a fantastic place to hike and see nature up close. So I have some tips. If you're walking somewhere, it's best to stay on the trails. These are cleared paths. They get foot traffic a lot, so they're less likely to have things like snakes on them because the snakes are aware that people come and go that there's a lot of foot traffic and if they think that we're all a bunch of potential predators they're less likely to be found on those places as opposed to in the tall grass or under logs if you have to go over those obstacles it is good to have closed shoes without open toes long pants are good especially jeans and thick material which can also protect you from other things like poison ivy or ticks Anytime you need to step near or around a log, it's good to not place your hands or feet directly at the border of those things, trying to lift or move them or step down right in front of them because you might be stepping in the doorway of somebody's hiding place, someone's home. So these are all good tips for when you're out walking in the space of these animals because they just want to stay hidden, stay camouflaged, eat their rodents, go about their business. Now I will put away the copperhead and I have one more exercise. For those of you who live near snakes, especially venomous snakes or other reptiles, if you're wondering the, about them coming into your yard or you've seen them in your yard, what do I do? Well, if you want to have a space for animals in your yard to feel safe, some people do, then just letting a corner of your yard grow up, just letting it kind of run wild is a good way to attract all sorts of wildlife. Having a log or some large stones or things, those would all attract animals because it is a safe place to hide, especially if you have something like a pond or a water feature, then those things are good resources for animals. So bearing that in mind, if you don't want the animals in your yard that way, those are all things that are attractive to them. That doesn't mean you can't have a bird bath or a pond, but just to be aware that it might cause wildlife to come into that space, which just means it's best to move around that space with caution. Oh, 
like hiking in the woods, not sticking your hands where you cannot see where they're going to land or you can't see what might be just underneath of something, just using caution around those spaces. So I have a couple examples set up right here. So I'm going to actually disconnect my camera so I can show you. Now, there are a lot of common things that we put in our yards every day. And we never really think because we think our yard is our yard. So it's just us here, right? Well, there may be some things that we don't know about. Let's say you have a dog and you have a water bowl out for your dog, of course. Why not? But if the bowl is dry and empty, you need to refill that, don't you? So you might want to pick it up. However, a dog bowl is a nice little round space. It's not tight to the ground, so it's a good way for a snake or a toad or anything, a rodent, to hide underneath. So dog bowls are a common space in which wildlife mistakenly think it is a nice place to hide. Now another thing, that you might have in your yard is a firewood pile or a wood pile for building. And of course, if this is the piece of wood you're wanting, you might be shuffling around trying to find that good spot, put your hand underneath. But here we are, <laughs> a wood pile, even though it might look like a neat stack of wood together, there are still gaps and spaces that wildlife can reach. So firewood piles, if you are trying to get something down off of it, it might be best to have a tool that can help you push wood away from it without that being your hands. Just on the off chance that it might have turned into a little firewood hotel for somebody. Uh, another common thing for people with children is having toys in the yard. Of course, kids love to bring toys outside. Of course, they love to not pick up toys, of course. But it is good to remember, especially to teach children, that this might look like a frisbee on the grass to us. But to an animal, it looks like a nice little roof above their heads. And that nice little roof can keep them safe. That is until they get a bit startled when you go to pick your frisbee back up. <laughs> so if you really want to convince your kids to clean up after them themselves, then this might be a good lesson to teach that you want animals in nature to have a safe place to go, but it needs to be safe for them and for us. We can live in harmony together. <laughs> Again, things in our yard, we like to, we should be able to enjoy our yards and relax. This is true, but we should also be careful because sometimes we can just have some unexpected surprises. And it's easy to get used to seeing the big picture. We might just see a chair and a frisbee, but life is all around us. And there could be some hidden surprises here and there. And we don't want, I, as a biologist, don't want the animals to get hurt. But as a fellow human, I don't want people to get hurt either. So it's good to be aware of these different things, these different ways that snakes can hide. Because in nature, this might just look like something else to them, a log leaf litter. They don't really discern what is what. If it's a dark space and it covers them from predators, then it makes perfect sense to them. So some good tips are to keep your yard clear of debris, put away your toys, or check underneath them with tools like a broom. Flip them over first to make sure no one's hiding beneath them. And also keeping your lawn short. If you don't want things like snakes in your yard, mothballs and chemicals, they can crawl right over those. They might not like the chemical if they were trapped in a tiny room with it, neither would we, but you can walk over a line of mothballs, so can they, they can crawl over it. So just keeping the yard neat, the grass short, you're just eliminating hiding spaces and, and just creating a space that is good for you and the way you live, but doesn't give them an opportunity to set up and hide and accidentally be found by you or your family. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation about reptiles in Eastern Kentucky. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please check out other Remake Learning Days events. If you search Remake Learning, you'll find resources that for STEM events all throughout Eastern Kentucky every year. And we hope to see you again next time. Bye. <laughs>